Hi everyone, welcome to the GDC Twitch channel. My name is Brian Francis. I am the invisible voice inside your head. I am here as always uh, representing GDC as the community manager, representing uh, the fine folks at Gamma Sutra. Oh boy, oh, oh, this is a new puzzle. Oh, uh, oh man, also, why is my. Uh, hang on. Okay, sorry, I'm gonna do the intro and then I'm gonna worry about this game. Okay, cool, that's intentional. Uh, hi, I'm Bryant, I'm a contributing editor at Gamma Sutra, I'm a community manager at GDC. In the lower left-hand corner of the screen, my friend Alex Walro has joined us today. Uh, Alex, how you doing? Uh, I'm doing all right. I just realized how odd it is that uh, because of a camera mix-up, I'm the only face on here. Yeah. Uh, and yet I'm the least interesting person on this stream. We have a very special guest with us today, a very special guest. Would you please tell everyone who you are and what you do? Okay, uh, hello there. I'm Arvid Eikari. I'm the developer of Baba Is You, and I was kindly asked to uh, be the disembodied voice on the stream to describe possibly what is happening on screen. I mean, and no maybe pressure. some other things. <laughs> uh, why don't we, we open a puzzle that just broke my brain, is all I can say. Um, Baba <laughs> Is You is a, a Game Developer Choice Award nominee this year. That's why we are here streaming it uh, with Arby. Um, Arby also, this game won, so, or it was nominated, it didn't win. It was nominated back at the IGFs in 2017. Or did it win? Uh, 18, yeah. yeah. 18. Uh, it was nominated in four categories and it won two categories. So. Right. It did win. The, I'm doing bad. Yeah, yeah, like. Oh yeah. It was nominated in Grand Prize Innovation or Nuova Award, the Excellence in Design and Best Student Game, and it won Excellence in Design and Student Game. Right on. Uh, with that in mind, uh, we are here. Uh, oh, nope, I don't want to do that. Um, uh, we are here playing Baba is You with RB, just taking your questions, chatting about the game design development after uh, after seeing it do so well at the awards this year. We just wanted to come back and chat with RB and see how things are going. Uh, you're working on a level editor, right, RB? Yeah, yeah, we are. Uh, we are going to release a level editor sometime this year. I was really hoping for a spring release date, but. As it happens, things always take longer than expected. So it's at this at this point, I'm trying to uh, avoid promising any dates. But yeah, it will be sometime this year. It's surprisingly difficult. Like when when you are a game developer, you sometimes want to make a level editor for your own use, and there you can just hide everything behind obscure uh, button combinations. But when you make a level editor for like actual users, you kind of have to make it nice to use, and that's surprisingly difficult mm -hmm. right yeah. on um well i try to figure out this puzzle right here and mostly just uh embarrass myself um would you mind uh getting into we uh i should also uh, give a shout out to the folks in chat we've got folks like writer of blocks hanging out um writer uh thanks for joining us uh we'll be taking questions from folks like you as we go on so if you have questions for rv please feel free to put them in chat. Um, I'm going to set about trying to solve this puzzle. Uh, so RV, I'm going to ask you a question and then go do that because I need, this is really hard on my brain. Um, <laughs> would you mind, I know, uh, would you mind retelling the story of where Baba is you came from and how you, you took it from uh, prototype to full-fledged indie game? That's a very nice, big question. Gives a pl plenty of time for the puzzles. Uh, so I was at the Nordic Game Jam which is one of these events where people make games in a time limit following a loose theme. Game jams are kind of popular nowadays. I guess most people are maybe at least to some extent aware of the concept. But anyway, uh, the Nordic Game Jam is one of my favorites. It's a very cozy, nice jam held in Copenhagen every year. And I was there in 2017. I was actually going there to meet my friends because uh, I have a lot of friends in Copenhagen and I had existing projects that I wanted to work on. So I, I was actually kind of sneakily going into the event with this mindset that, okay, I, I don't mind if I don't make a game for the jam, I'm here for the like social uh, element of it. But then uh, the theme of the game jam was released, uh, revealed. It's a very uh, loose jam, like you are not supposed to be super strict about following the theme. Uh, you are free to interpret it however you want. And the theme was not there, which kind of, I just pondered about. Uh, congratulations, nice work on the level. Thank you. <laughs> so I thought about the theme and uh, for some reason, I, don't, I 
I have no idea why, I latched onto the first part, the not word, mm -hmm. and started thinking how in logic and I guess programming, you can say, have a like concept, something like push, and you can inverse or reverse its meaning by saying not push. So not has this kind of reversal meaning in some contexts. And uh, I had played some really good puzzle games over the past some uh, couple of years, for example, uh, Stephen Sausage Roll and Snake Bird, two extremely difficult but very satisfying, very enjoyable puzzle games I had liked a lot, and Braid several years earlier. All those games had kind of filled me with a desire to make a puzzle game, but I had always run into some design problems. There were some things I couldn't kind of get working when I tried to make my own puzzle games. And uh, the kind of inspiration I had gathered over the years from these puzzle games uh, wobbled in my head as I thought about this not there theme and uh, eventually they just kind of combined together into this mental image of a, like a block pushing game where there would be a pool of, a pool of lava, some blocks of ice and uh, the ice, congratulations, uh, the ice would be meltable in the lava obviously because lava is hot, ice is meltable but then you would be as a player able to say ice is not melt and that's kind of the as far as i can remember that's kind of the beginning of the idea and uh yeah it, i wasn't super certain about the idea at first it sounded like a, it would be maybe a bit dull or it would be difficult to figure out puzzles for that kind of a concept and also i wasn't really sure at first what what kind of a game it would be but i started working on it because one of the nice things about game jams is that is that i can just i just decided okay I'll do something. If it doesn't work, I can scrap it. I don't have to think about it anymore. I can go cry in a corner. If it works, I can be happy and get friends. And uh, so I just started prototyping it and it turned out to be working pretty well. And other people also, they kind of came to look over my shoulder and say that, hey, that looks super cool or pretty cool at least. And that uh, encouraged me. And I ended up winning the game jam, like being voted the best game of the game jam and that combined with that encouragement from my colleagues uh, convinced me that I should make a full game out of it and then two years later uh, things happened and the game was released. Yeah, uh, I say some things happened for sure. I mean you you won those awards, the game came out, it seemed to do quite well. Uh, something we didn't mention at the top of the show, you are nominated this year for two Game Developers Choice Awards at GDC. I think it's uh, best design and maybe best debut or most innovation. I think. Uh, I think it's uh, innovation and design. Yeah. Yeah, innovation and design. Quite right. And those are like really incredible awards to be up for. And I think Baba is you is eminently deserving of that. Um, when you Thank talk you. about, <laughs> uh, no worries. Uh, when you talk about uh, the process of implementing that basic idea during the jam and seeing that it worked pretty well. Um, I feel like you might be glossing over a lot there, and I, I really want to know, <laughs> like how, how how did it work at first? Because this uh, the entire idea, this negation of, um, well, the, the approach to the design. Like I've never seen anything like this in a commercial game that I can recall, and I would guess that it must have been real tricky to implement. Uh, hmm. Well, first of all, the whole not there, like the not word, kind of disappeared in development because pretty quickly when I started working on the prototype I realized that it's actually thematically way cooler if the lava is not hot by default and the ice is not meltable by default like if nothing has inherent abilities but instead everything is stated by the rules uh, it, it, it felt just like a way cooler thing in my head uh, but also it kind of invalidated the whole not thing. Why say ice is not melt if the ice isn't melt by default anyway? Right. So that's kind of one of the first things that happened when I started working on the game. But to be honest, uh, because especially at game jams, uh, you don't really worry about implementing things well. You can just hack things in. Uh, the only only thing you need to care about is that you have something that's at least seems to work after the 48 or 72 hours or however long the game jam takes or lasts. Mm -hmm. So with Baba Is You, I kind of, I had fairly recently, only about a year ago, I had learned the Lua scripting language, 
And I fairly quickly figured out a pretty simple syntax that would let me just kind of uh, read the rules you know, on the screen, put all those rules on a list or actually on a couple of different lists and then let me on runtime ask the game like, hey, is this rule, does this rule exist or if is something you, if something is you, please return all the things that are you and then I can do something for all those things that are you. So the kind of basic system of the game is built very largely around this kind of asking these questions of, hey, game, please tell me everyone who fulfills this requirement, uh, especially, especially later on when I added this kind of conditional words, so spoiler alert, eventually there will be conditionals that can be added to the rules. Mm. So especially when those were added, it became even more important to have these kind of please return me all the things that are you while also taking into account all these kind of conditionals or special cases that might appear. And those special cases are where the development became like really tricky. Mm. I would say that the like basic rule system is actually fairly simple, but there are some certain areas where the game even now is not working at all perfectly. And when I release the level editor, I will probably spend endless hours pulling my hair out, trying to make some kind of a passable compromise between things working and me dying of old age. That yeah. actually brings us to a good question from chat, which is, uh, oh, I have a question. What's the most challenging thing you've encountered when developing the level editor? That comes from Writer of Blocks. Uh, yeah, thanks for the question. I'd say that so far, uh, one thing that I we haven't implemented fully yet, and I won't be responsible for large parts of the code or most of the code because I'm, I can't do networking stuff, but the, uh, the level editor is going to have a level sharing functionality. We'll be able to share levels with others. And uh, I'm pretty sure that there will be some things related to that that will turn out to be surprisingly tricky, like a, a how to handle the kind of which levels to show first and so on. But uh, that's not my concern, uh, kind of. So I guess I should say about the things I, I myself implemented. Uh, and for from those, I'd say that the, um, when I made the level editor for the game originally, the one that I used personally to kind of make the game, uh, I had only a fairly limited amount of things I could put in a level, like in this level you can see there's algae, 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 how do you pronounce it, I don't know, okay. uh, there's baba, sorry? Uh, algae. Algae, thank you. So there's some tiles, there's a brickwork, there's a walls, a flag, baba, there, there were a limited amount of those, uh, a limited amount of words, so I could just like do a huge list of everything and when you press tab in the editor it just shows you almost everything and you can pick from there and do some adjustments if needed. But for the final editor, there will be too many things to really show just as a single list. It would be really confusing to use if the player had to kind of browse a huge list every time they want to add something. Uh, do you want a hint? Yeah. Take it, Brian. Yeah. Uh, hmm. So you beat a level when something that is you touches something that is win. Yes. And so Yes. I will go I will <laughs> go with that. <laughs> okay. Congratulations. <laughs> so for the final version of the editor, uh, I had to implement the system where you kind of have kind of a palette or a selection of objects you can pick from to add to the level. And then you can add and remove objects from that list. So you have kind of like a level specific palette of objects. And then you have the like full list and you have to be able to interact with those. And there has to be like a search functionality and tag functionality. So you can easily find the things you want to find. And implementing that system has been uh, not as terrible as I assumed it could be, but I've been streaming developing Baba Is You pretty frequently this year. And uh, during the last stream, I definitely felt pretty exhausted at the end of the stream when I kind of managed to 
optimize a system for finding certain objects and displaying their icons in the editor. So it's a, it's a fairly complicated thing. Uh, it, it's also kind of probably pretty un, uninteresting sounding because it's such a kind of like a technical thing. But uh, to answer honestly, that would be my answer. <laughs> I think you should be very technical and detailed. Like most people watching this are going to be game developers themselves. Or just type uh, okay. fans of the game. We got some folks like Kyron Glyph who dropped in the chat saying, "Hey, I'm uh, And uh, Nick's Mad Science uh, thinks it's cool to see Baba getting a GDC shout out. Man, Nick, you got that backwards. It's cool that it's cool that he came on to our stream. That's right. <laughs> it's very kind of you to invite me, as mentioned. It's super nice to be able to see people play the game and uh, say words about it as well. <laughs> Alex, I'm going to toss the question ball to you. Oh, yeah, we, we've covered a couple things I wanted to dig into deeper. Let's just pick one at random. Tell me a bit about um, puzzle game design, because I, you know, I've been keeping track of your work. Uh, for folks who don't know, you've made, I think, dozens of games, right? They're on your website. This is sort of the one that has gotten a lot of attention recently, but you're working on some other stuff as well. And I think your last project and your next project are sort of a more metroidvania type game so i'm i'm so so curious uh wh what do you appreciate about puzzle game design and like sort of what is challenging about it that um you are dealing with right now because i imagine laying out these levels must be um like brain breaking <laughs> uh well for the things you said earlier i think i counted all the games i've made if we also count like very small jam games and i think there was like 45 or so that i've made over the past 12 years, I think. That's, yeah. Yeah, but yeah, most of them are just like, I made this in one hour because I, I was young and decided that making a game in one hour is fun. Uh, Counts. And yeah, the game that I'm working on currently is a sequel to my first commercial title. And it, yeah, it's a Metroidvania. I kind of promised people that I would make a sequel. And I, it's, it's fun to make a Metroidvania, uh, even though I've been more in the puzzle world lately. Mm -hmm. But yeah, for puzzle games, uh, I think uh, the thing that I like most in puzzle games and puzzle game design is is that when I make games, I usually strive for um, making something surprising or amazing. I haven't really found the good like words in English, English, but the idea is that like to best express what I mean is that for me, it's a lot of fun if I see someone play my game and the game does something that catches them by su surprise in a good way so that they like maybe burst out laughing in surprise like what what the game did th this kind of a thing what that kind of mm. that kind of uh, experience is what i live for when making games uh, metroidvanias are are nice for that because they can have secrets and boss fights and uh, that kind of thing things but i think puzzle games are even more suited for that because they can have like meta puzzles they can have uh, they can have things where uh, some simple idea is iterated in some way that the player doesn't expect at all. Mm -hmm. And in Baba is You, I kind of try to make every level or as, as many levels as possible do something new so that there I would kind of maximize the amount of these kinds of surprising moments, surprising twists. That is something that I learned from the Steve and Sausage Roll and the Snake Bird games. Like those games both. Um, kind of do a really good job at requiring you to do something at least slightly unique mm. in uh, every level. And that, that is something I kind of strove for and that I find enjoying enjoyable when I play puzzle games myself. And I'm actually kind of trying to, always trying to find more puzzle games that follow a similar system. This actually, just uh, to pause for a moment and talk about the game being played here, Please. It's actually a very good kind of non-tutorial moment that I should have maybe tutorialized better, which is that you, there are these two new words, open and shut. Mm -hmm. And what those words do literally, spoiler alert, is that if something is shut, if it touches something that is open, they destroy each other. And saying like, if something is open, if a door is open and it touches a key that is shut, they destroy each other. But Obviously, for a very obvious reason, if, if the game says door is shut, people assume that the door is like a solid object, that you cannot move through it. But right. that is not actually true. And the reason why breaking the rule, door is shut, didn't let you pass through the door is because there is also door is stop at the top. And oh, that, that level, yeah. 
causes a lot of trouble and I feel that it's kind of a at least to some extent it's a failure from my kind of tutorializing I just kind of wanted to point it out that's interesting because no. from a subconscious perspective my brain was already tracking towards if I change what the door is I can get through the door sorry Alex I jumped on you there um, no not at all uh, um, and that's it's interesting to hear you describe that problem because I did sense it as I ran through it because I got confused why killing door to stop didn't do anything but then it just sort of thankfully my brain just subverted or moved to the next problem solving technique which you know like i was testing a hypothesis right like this game is very hypothesis testing. if i try this then this will happen and thankfully um uh um uh that just let me try something different nope so wall is defeat god damn it <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's some, someone pointed like a player pointed out at some point that i should have made the word uh open should have should be unlock and shut should be locked mm -hmm. and i agree Mm. It would be maybe a bit more informative or like more intuitive. Uh, there's actually a pretty interesting story. I'm getting sidetracked, but there's the word Please. defeat. And in the original Game Jam version of the game, the word was actually kill. But because the game is so cutesy, and I also kind of, despite developing a Metroidvania, I generally prefer having like non-violence okay. non -violence in my games. I try to find figure out solutions that are less violent if possible. So I felt kill was a very violent word, especially like if you see that here's Baba, Baba is killed. That's brutal. And I spent uh, in the end, I think like a half a year figure, trying to figure out what to change the word kill to. And uh, because the idea is that kill only destroy something that is you. It doesn't harm anything else but you. So the idea is that it's harmful to living things, so to say. Mm -hmm. And uh, Kill conveys that idea really well. And I think like after trying many ideas and getting suggestions from people, defeat was the like next best answer. There was like gone and poof and uh, I don't remember uh, the others, but there were several suggestions we went through. Um, this is an interesting problem. I'm going to ask a question based on what's going on right here. Um, uh, mm -hmm. Folks in chat, we are going to get to your questions. Thank you for hanging out and uh, chatting already. Um, I do want to give you guys... Um, I, I'm faced with a decision right now to either keep clearing out the levels in here, and I... I um, uh, or I have the decision to move on to the next area, um, which is loading, uh, going back up to the map. Uh, I don't know why. Oh, it loaded this for some reason. I don't know why. That, oh, because I'm using the wrong controller. Um, <laughs> uh, or I missed. Uh, so, what what I would like to know is what was your mindset behind creating these scenarios where players could either finish finish an area and then move on versus like giving them the opportunity to move here. I'm going to go ahead and move on to the next area just so we have some variety on the stream and I'm curious what your thought process was behind that as a game designer. Uh, before you go, I would suggest playing one more level in the previous area. That's what uh, I was worried about because I was worried that if I skipped something I wouldn't learn something. Yeah, if you play level 9, this yeah. explains a thing that but, could be helpful. But if that's the case, like, why did you let me do that? Like, Why would you let me advance here without learning something useful here? I guess in this specific case it's an oversight from my part. <laughs> but uh, the reason, uh, the kind of... Um, if, if we discount this play, this specific situation where something that is would be useful is maybe not taught by the game if you skip these levels, uh, I wanted to make it so that you always have as many options as possible for uh, kind of progressing, because in in a puzzle game it's very easy to get mentally stuck uh, and uh, kind of. If you only have one option for a puzzle, if you get stuck in that puzzle, it might be that uh, you kind of you won't get anywhere because you are stuck trying a single idea over and over and not kind of uh, refreshing your mind. You need to take a break to kind of refresh your concept on what you are doing. And the offering the players multiple options uh, to pick from, I feel is nicer because if they get stuck in one puzzle they still have, can do something in the game they don't have to close the game and wait until they get the insight they can go to other level which might be easier for them uh, another reason is that in Baba is You I felt that it would be best if the levels were grouped by the words used in them 
instead of by like purely by difficulty. Obviously, there needs to be like a difficulty curve, but especially because some of the specific words are very odd, so to say, like very complex, very specific. Uh, I felt that it would be nicer if the player doesn't have to learn so many words at once, but instead different areas would have different words. And if I group the levels yeah, using that criteria, there will inevitably be levels that are easier in one area than there were some levels in the earlier areas. Like if I introduce a new word entirely, a new concept, I need to make an easy level that tutorializes that concept. And uh, so I think it, I thought it would be odd if there would be the player kind of uh, is, uh, expects an even difficulty curve and then gets into a new area and they're like, hey, this is a super easy level. So I decided to go with the concept that every area kind of resets the difficulty curve at least a little bit, like pushes it back. So in ev every area you can start from the easy levels, you can beat the easy levels and move on. But if you want, you can keep going for the harder levels that like really explore the limits of the words introduced in those worlds. And this is partially also related to how... Uh, because I knew that uh, the game would be possibly pretty pretty difficult. It's very hard to estimate estimate as a game developer how difficult a game is uh, by yourself. But I assumed that the game would be pretty difficult. But I knew that there would be people who like to play these kinds of games, or that they, that would like to see the, like Baba in action, even if they don't enjoy playing super hard puzzle games. I wanted to have a system where they, or actually a tester suggested having a system for kind of opting out once you have seen enough so that people who want to see the system but don't want to get super hardcore on it, they can play the game, they get offered some like, hey, if you beat this level, you can say that you beat the game and you can move on. You don't have to get stressed and annoyed about the difficulty. So uh, the game is now structured so that you only need to beat, I think, about 30 levels to get access to the final level. There's still more to do. There are plenty more levels after that, but you can still like you can complete the game technically at a very early stage, and that's also related to this kind of map structuring. Nice. I'm gonna go ahead and grab a good question here from chat because there have been so many. Uh, Rider of Blocks wants to know what inspired the cutesy design of the game. They love Baba's design. So how did you come <laughs> up with this unique aesthetic? Yeah. So uh, at the game jam you have, or I had only 48 hours to make everything. So I, my go-to method has been to use the default Windows Palais, like the old uh, Windows 98 Palais with fully saturated everything. Oh, yeah. uh, I actually kind of like that Palais nowadays because I've used it so many times and I've been corrupted by it. And uh, in Baba is You, everything was static. Uh, they were just like moving pictures on the screen. And when I started working on the full game, I spent some time worrying that uh, maybe I should make the graphical style very kind of appealing to the masses, so to say, to kind of put it uh, in a kind of a condescending way. Uh, I wondered if I should go for 3D art. If I went for 3D art, I would have to learn a new tool because the tool I used to make Baba is You cannot do 3D art. So I was kind of conflicted about this kind of, maybe I should spend the, ex spend the extra effort to make the game really appealing and then spend more time having to learn the tools to uh, get it finished. Or maybe I should go with a style that I can already do and uh, accept that the game will probably be a bit less interesting looking or a lot less interesting looking. And the final decision for this specific style came from two sources. First was that I had played the game Crayon Physics Deluxe by Petri Purho uh, in 2008. It won the Sumas McNally Grand Prize in 2008. Uh, and it had a really nice, this like crayony style where uh, things were had this kind of slight animation, slight wobble all the time. Right. And, uh, as a young game developer, I actually made clones of that game. Uh, Petri likes to 
mention it from time to time when we meet. Uh, but I got really attached to this kind of wobbly style, and I also use it in some non-clone ideas later on. That kind of a similar idea where I draw every animation frame several times to get this kind of slight wobble to everything. So I already knew that 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 style works. And the other inspiration came from a fellow developer, uh, Jason Boyer, who has actually just recently released the Kickstarter for their new game, uh, like a mecha dating game. Right. Uh, I'm so, I'm so sorry. I don't remember the exact name right now. Don't feel bad about it. Yeah. <laughs> but, Google uh, that's good. They had a they made a stream uh, playing Baba Is You with their friends pretty quickly after I released the original game jam version on each IO. The game is actually still available freeware on each IO if you play, want to see the like very original version of it. Right. And uh, for the stream, they made or video they made like a piece of fan art where they interpreted Baba as a, like a cute bipedal goat person. In the original sprite, I had intended Baba to be a robot. They had like a tiny antenna and they were like bipedal robots. But Jason interpreted those antennae as horns. And uh, to be honest, I really like that design. A robot is kind of clinical, often, not always, but often kind of boring. It's a very easy, this kind of non-personal abstract main character option for hacks like me who don't know how to do interesting looking robots so after seeing jason's fan art and kind of pondering what, where i should go with the visual style uh i realized that okay maybe actually if i use this wobbly style that i'm comfortable with using and i know how it works and if i do like a cutesy style i think it would really work really well with the game also, because Baba Is You, like many people told me after the game jam that Baba Is You contains in their eyes some kind of interesting philosophical concepts. Like you can consider the word you to be like a the, the consciousness and the consciousness moves through objects. Many, many different things can be conscious oh, yeah. uh, and they have their own agency when they're conscious, but they can be only conscious one at a time, this kind of thing. And I thought it would be a kind of a funny juxtaposition if some people could see this kind of deep themes or kind of a morbid themes in Baba Is You, but at the same time the game would, game would have this kind of very harmless uh, visual style going I on. I love that. Yeah, I had not thought about it at all about how this game reflects the uh, notion of consciousness as transitory. That's oh wow, that's that's good. Um, yeah, there's a, there's a Buddhism going on if you look <laughs> look into it. Right. Yeah, man. You made a good video game. There's a question here. I have some more questions, but there's another one here in chat that I want to get to. It's a good follow-up. It's, um, forgive me if I butcher this. It's it's Mia Vinash uh, asks, they have a technical question. They want to know, how did you learn to code games? They know a little bit of Python and C++, but engines like Unity seem very difficult to learn. Um, <laughs> yeah, this is a kind of a embarrassing question in a way. Not really, but... Uh, Oh, do go on. Uh, I was I was just wondering if I should ask if a hint is needed, but I, I guess I'll... No, nice, no, no, nice. no, 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 no. <laughs> yeah. We're not here to win, we're here to play. Yeah, so Baba Is You was made mostly, or like the base engine is a game creation tool, kind of like Game Maker, but not exactly Game Maker, called Multimedia Fusion 2 by Click Team. Right. Uh, it's a fairly old program. There are newer versions, but I use an older version because I'm old school. And uh, Multimedia Fusion and its predecessors were actually the kind of one of the first graphical no coding experience needed game creation tools in the market. The first version uh, was released in 1994. So it's a pretty old, old family of tools. Oh, yeah. And they used to be very popular, but then programs such as Game Maker and Construct kind of advanced so far that Multimedia Fusion and Click Team Fusion, it's a follower, have been a bit less, uh, they're not as common nowadays that they used to be like 10 years ago or so. And uh, I was in primary school, a schoolmate asked me if I want to make games. I super wanted to make games. I had played uh, Super Mario World on my cousin Super Nintendo and I really wanted to make games. I had also drawn video games in kindergarten on paper. I wanted to make games. So oh, a yeah. uh, schoolmate introduced Game Maker to me. I think Game Maker, what, Game Maker was in version four or something at that point. It was uh, 
early, early times, like 2002 or something like that. And we started making games. We made like a space innovator with Pac-Man in Game Maker, stuff like that. But Game Maker has its own scripting language, the GML. And uh, because I was in primary school, I didn't understand English very well, and I didn't have very much patience. So learning a scripting language was way beyond me, apart from like simple copying code from examples that wasn't really satisfactory. So eventually another uh, schoolmate introduced the program called The Games Factory to me, which is basically the predecessor of Multimedia Fusion. And that one didn't require any coding. There was no scripting at all. It was purely graphical. And that was perfect for me because I, even if I didn't understand what something meant, I could trial and error my way through it. Right. So that's how I started. And there was actually a, like a boom of like preteen kids making their own games in the games factory in Finland specifically in like early how out how, how do you say like in the early 2000s? Right. And I kind of. Yeah, I followed that boom even though I didn't have my own website and I was uh, too young to put my games online or, or even to finish anything. And then in 2016, after using Multimedia Fusion for like uh, eight years happily, without knowing any programming, I tried to get into Unity, I tried to get into ActionScript, I tried to get into some other languages, but uh, they always felt too intimidating. A good friend of mine, Lucas Meller, who has taught me a lot of things about game development and programming, uh, told me that there's a plugin for Multimedia Fusion 2 uh, that lets me use the Lua scripting language. And they basically taught me, they made me tutorials uh, for how to use Lua in general and also how to use Lua in Multimedia Fusion specifically. And then I guess the time was right. I was old enough. At that point, I kind of understood English a little bit uh, as a, at the ripe age of like 23 or something, 24. And uh, congratulations, nice. Thank you. Uh, and uh, so I, I got really quickly into Lua and uh, one year passed and I got the idea for Baba Is You and uh, like Lua has been very inter integral for the process. So right now I just make games by using this engine from 2006 combined with Lua. Nice, it's classics. Um, real quick, I'm just curious, uh, what is uh, not having English as your first language like when you're trying to be a successful international game developer? You, I mean, that's a specific example of how you sort of found it difficult to use the tools until you were at a higher proficiency with the language, but in any other way, like has it been uh, uh, has it been challenging or, or, or in any way interesting to try and overcome those barriers? Uh, not really, because in Finland, uh, most of most kids of my generation learned English really quickly because it was the time of Amazon Messenger and uh, internet forums and so on. Like so, a lot of kids, even those who were not interested in making games or even playing games. Uh, learned English at a very young age. Also, Finland doesn't have the kind of uh, dubbing as much. We use more subtitles on TV, so many kids learned English by watching movies, a subtitle and so on, so it was never really a problem. I've looked at some of my earliest posts on some internet forums from like from like 2006 do and it's yeah, they, they, are, they, they are filled with XD and uh, typos and some interesting... There's actually a very nice anecdote where Using English was really cool, obviously, even before I could understand English, but like, just like when you don't speak English, it's always slightly cooler to use a different language than your own. And I tried to make like a game where you're a soldier fighting against aliens and you go into missions to kind of kill aliens, basically. And the first mission was such that you are in a, like a anti-air artillery bunker and you need to eradicate all the aliens there. And I had tried to write that like mission uh, explanation without knowing much English. And the mm. final sentence that came into the game was, wash the fly bunker for aliens. <laughs> and the, <laughs> it, it wasn't really... Uh, I mean, it's, I didn't it's know expressive. It then. <laughs> I, got, I got some words, like some of the grammar makes sense. So it wasn't total failure, but it, it didn't really convey the 
correct idea. Right on. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I only ask because I specifically, I have never, even though I probably should have heard this more often, I have never heard a game designer mention uh, English language proficiency as part of their, one of the hurdles to adopting a new programming language or learning the fine, more complex, you know, nature of a language. So that's just something I never really thought about at all is sort of the, another uh, aspect of privilege that comes with that language is so many of them are written by default in English. Um, yeah, it's it's definitely like definitely when I was in primary school, it kind of slowed the process. And it, it might be that if I had understood English natively, I would have been able to get into actual programming languages instead of game creation tools. But you know, who, who can say what would have happened? So it's it I didn't really consider it a huge problem. And it's actually a huge perk that English words look cooler because it's very way easier to give like fantasy names to things like there's the super nintendo game f-zero where one of the ships or the racing things is called wild goose or wild geese or something oh, like yeah. that and as a kid i didn't understand what a what the goose is and i was like oh this is some cool sci-fi name it's like a <laughs> super monster and then when yeah. i realized oh it's a bird it was i like if, if i would have called it uh, Villihanhi in Finnish, it would be in. I mean, that, 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 that's cool. That must have made Top Gun really weird. <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's a scary bird. I mean, I live across the street from a bird habitat, and geese will mess you up. I mean, wild wild goose is not <laughs> is an intimidating. Um, anyway, <laughs> I didn't know that then. That I think everyone has learned about geese over the past year. Right. Yeah. Nick's mad science in chat calls out Untitled Goose Game as the new harbinger of the the goose uh, mm-hmm. future uh, <laughs> over us. yeah um there's, there's more actually there's maybe not there's one small question in chat maybe we can just clear up from nick's mad science they just wanted to check in and, and verify when we were talking about lua and fusion interacting do the, the lua fuels kind of, pardon me do the lua files does lua kind of dictate how, what happens in engine or is there any greater um tie there between the two uh tools uh that's a very interesting and possibly difficult question to answer uh, yeah. well, but uh, in Baba SU specifically, Multimedia Fusion mostly handles anything that is kind of graphical in some way, uh, and also some things that are just more intuitive for me to make using Multimedia Fusion syntax. For example, if I need to attach an object to another object, uh, for whatever reason, there are some situations. For example, if a, there's a button and the button needs to have text that is kind of stuck in the button, that is easier for me to do using Multimedia Fusion than Lua because Multimedia Fusion handles things like destroying objects and creating new objects. But for the most part, the actual rule changing logic is in Lua. And the plugin that allows me to use uh, Lua functionality in Multimedia Fusion has some really nice tools. For example, because Multimedia Fusion is an object-based language and all the things you see on the screen are just objects that can have animations and things happening to them. So the plugin allows me to kind of add objects from Multimedia Fusion to Lua. So they kind of become entities in the Lua. So I can just refer to them and change their values directly in Lua instead of having to do some kind of like a, here's a Lua function that calls Multimedia Fusion to do something to the object and return something back. And instead I can just do all of that directly in Lua. And it's been extremely helpful, except for the part where the plugin, sorry, where the plugins developer stopped working on it at one point. (laughs) And uh, there's a memory leak related to that specific functionality. So if you play, the multimedia fusion version of the game for long enough it will it will crash but apart from that it was very powerful and useful <laughs> mm. yeah thanks for thanks for getting into that i know it can be tricky sometimes to uh explain in a cogent way the the weird ways that uh tech tools and you know programming languages have all kind of hinged together but that's that's kind of what we're about here so i appreciate it uh yeah no this is uh let's uh, i kind of want to as we get to the end of our hour here and please we got about 15 more minutes left so if you do have any burning questions get them out now um 
I kind of want to know how you're feeling now that the game's out and released. I mean, you're working on meaningful updates and a new project, uh, and you're up for a new slate of awards uh, next month. Um, how are you feeling? Like, how has this game changed your career as a game developer, and, and what's different now uh, that Baba is you is out and in the world? Uh, I get more emails. Mm. I, after the release of Baba is You, I recently counted and I've like personally answered to well over 1,300 emails on my own. Uh, don't work. do that. <laughs> it's, no. It's not a good idea to answer that many emails. You should uh, preserve yourself from that. Uh, <laughs> but. Um, yeah, Baba's success has definitely enabled me to be more relaxed about my future things. I can be in a situation where uh, like, I can plan my life so that I can actually kind of have working hours. I can try to make it so that I get enough exercise and I, I can like, I, can, I just have more ability to plan what to do with my life uh, so that I live a healthy life instead of having to worry as much about like everything burning down on me uh, like ending up bankrupt or some, something it kind of it kind of simultaneously gives me that kind of a peace of mind but partially related to those emails it does also make everything more stressful because it also means that there are more eyes on what I do. It hasn't, that part of it hasn't really manifested in the way it could have. Like I, I could imagine there being some really awkward situations and there might be in the future, like if someone get re gets really invested in Baba and expects me to do something and he gets angry when I don't do that and that kind of stuff. I'm very neurotic, so I'm very good at imagining uh, those kinds of things happening, but that kind of stuff hasn't really happened, but it's still like the, the idea that, okay, those are now more of a possibility than they would have been earlier is sometimes, sometimes stressful uh, and uh, yeah, I, I guess, I guess I could list things like that. It, I guess the like baseline is that things are more stressful in some ways, but they are also more peaceful in like economical, what do I spend my time on ways. Mm. Yeah, I'm, I mean, I, I'm generally glad to hear that. It sounds uh, like the price of success. Are you still contributing to Noida at all? I know you were working on that for a little while. Uh, yeah, actually, actually, like a spoiler, a spoiler alert, Baba Is You was made entirely on my free time. My day job was Noida for the past seven years. Yeah. Uh, I'm now, I'm currently not working on Noita anymore. Uh, after seven years, it was kind of, the game came out on early access. Early access and the SIB is, has been doing really, like, well, people have been seeming to like the game a lot and so on. So it was kind of, uh, it was time to look for, look for other, pro like, or like, set my sights in the future as they say i'm sure. sad you can see my hand waving over here but like imagine artistic hand waves but yeah uh noita was kind of <laughs> has well, been a big part of my past several years nice yeah I was and say, noita right. is also in gdca awards this year so that's that's also a thing it's nice that people have uh kind of received it so so very kindly yeah no absolutely i think um I think that sort of points to uh, a through line in these two games, right? I mean, I think both were also in the IGF as well. I mean, both have sort of gotten attention uh, for being sort of innovative and rule breaking and, and sort of getting into like the real, uh, well, they've both gotten attention for a lot of good reasons. And I'm so curious to know, like they both sort of point to a theory of game design that you spoke to earlier, how you love games that, um, you know, foster opportunities for players to go, oh, like aha moments, right? Where you just realize what you're supposed to do, where you discover something you didn't know worked. Um, so much of Noida is about like figuring out how systems work together and discovering new and interesting ways to use them. Um, I'm just curious, what uh, do you agree with that? And if so, like, what what is it about that school of game design and game, you know, that really, uh, you know, motivates you and inspires you? Why do you? Uh, well, I, I think it's. Uh... 
from my personal perspective, uh, I maybe wouldn't uh, do an entirely similar comparison because from my point of view, in Noita, the kind of uh, the surprise of how things work is very closely related to uh, like synergy in games, which is a very big like old school roguelike thing. The thing where surprising things have been taken into account by the developers and uh, you can do things that you that might not work in all games because they haven't been coded to take those into account but they still work in Noita whereas in Baba is You it's more it's less the kind of emergent dynamic world uh, part of it and more the kind of uh, developer intentionally building hard or not hard coded but like a building handcrafted tricks to trick you and surprise you but and also in with Noita uh, all the basically all the cool things you have seen of Noita uh, all the synergy and dynamic things are more uh, to the credit of the amazing programmers Oli and Petri in the team who kind of made those things a reality I've, I'm I'd be more in the kind of design and graphics department of things but i know that that kind of synergy the fact that things that usually in games you don't expect to work do work and have interactions together is something that uh, i would say has been a very big driving force behind noita specifically Mm. yeah no fair enough that's a great point it is uh so much about Baba is you is about that feeling of uh, you know like dealing directly with the mind of the puzzle designer and trying to figure out what they want you to do. Uh, mm-hmm. Again, we have about five minutes left, so if you have any questions in there, get them in. But uh, otherwise, I'll I'm just gonna. Alyssa Macaloon, yeah. our uh, uh, Gamma Sutra editor person, who uh, editor person, she's the editor. Um, Vaunted, <laughs> I think she's an associate publisher as well. She's she's, she's a big deal, Gamma publisher. Sutra. She's an associate publisher. I should use her right title. Yeah. Um, uh, she had a question. Um, her question was literally, uh, "How level design is possible?" And my joke to her was that clearly you just wrote down level design and possible and stuck an is between them, and that's how level design <laughs> happened. Um, what was your mindset for making Baba as you levels? And, and like, I mean, I guess like this is we're at an interesting level right now, so I guess you can explain some of your thoughts to us using this level. I don't know, maybe. Who knows? Uh, uh, it was basically like. Pikachu came came to me in my dreams and told me you need to make these levels, and I just follow the holy word of Pikachu. That's uh, fair. That's fair. <laughs> Convenient. So, the way I've kind of used to explain, sorry for cutting you off. No, 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 uh, no. Go for it. Okay, okay. Uh, so for me, the way I've explained Baba's use level design has been using the term reverse engineering and completely misusing the term. But here we go anyway. So uh, the way I approach level design or I would like to say I approach level design this way. Obviously, anytime a game developer says that I did this to make the game, they are lying because they are like combining many things, both consciously and unconsciously. But at least when it comes to what I consciously know that I tried to do in Baba is You, uh, I had these different words and different mechanics. There was the block pushing part, the different movement systems, and actually implementing the movement system was one of those like extremely difficult things that are still broken in many ways that you hopefully don't notice. Uh, and I have these different rules that could interact with each other. So when I started a new level or when I kind of made mental notes about, about level ideas, I usually try to think of those uh, systems and concepts and words and combine them in my, in my mind, just kind of trying to figure out uh, combinations of words or combinations of words and mechanics that I hadn't considered before. Like, what would happen if I have this and this thing coexisting at the same time? Is there something cool that could happen? Like something that looks cool or feels cool or is surprising in some way? And you, for, for a very long time, very long time, it was very easy to come up with those surprises. Like uh, I could get a lot of ideas of kind of, oh, that would be pretty surprising, all right. And uh, so I kind of mm, took one of those ideas, those that felt especially cool, or sometimes those that didn't feel especially cool, and uh, those didn't make as good levels, and I canned them eventually. But something that felt like it could have potential to make an interesting interaction. And then I made a level where 
I try to build a structure that forces the player to use that specific interaction to solve it. So that if I think the interaction looks or feels cool, the player has to see the cool thing to solve the level. So in this particular level, this was actually added later after the release because I felt uh, the weight functionality that you can press a button where things that are move, move, but Baba doesn't move, needed some tutorialization. I completely botched the work because this doesn't work really well as a tutorial, but that's the kind of intention behind this. So here, my mindset was that, okay, you can press A to wait and let things that move, move, but make like you not move for one turn. I would like to make a level where you're forced to use the wait button to solve the level. And uh, then I just like organically put walls down. It was very hard to make paper notes for Baba Is You because it was so so much easier to kind of doodle things in the actual editor and see how things work. So in this case, I just doodled the level. I think I took a couple, it took a couple of tries, but eventually I ended up with this structure. Sometimes afterwards I felt that the solution was too obvious and added some like extra elements to kind of obfuscate the solution. But that was sometimes also a bad, bad idea because it could like drive the player's attention away from the cool twist. But then, uh, yeah, that's, that's kind of the basic, basic process. I guess this level is not the best example because the, here the cool interaction is a very simple one. It's like press one button. Uh, where I, I won't tell you when you need to press that button to solve the level. But that's what you need to do at one point of the level to solve it. I guess a better example would be that there's later on the word shift that makes things work as conveyor belts. Like belt is shift and if you move on a belt, the belt pushes you along. And I realized that if you put two belts on top of each other, obviously they push each other at the same time. So they just become like a, this perpetual mo mobile that just moves on uh, forever, like two conveyor belts pushing each other. And I made a level around that because it was a cool sounding uh, interaction between the same word, but still kind of two things doing some something. This level is instantly one of my favorites because I failed and found the solution. I, fa I failed and it showed me a way forward. Uh, yeah, that's, that's nice. Work, that's what I'm working on right now. Man, I could play this game all day. Uh, we could we could yak it up all day. Um, uh, but uh, I do not quite... We do not quite have the time to do that. Um, oh man, I'm so close. I'm so close. I need to make Skull Bolt, I think. Um, or maybe I'm wrong. But anyway... I sadly need to wrap things up. Uh, if you enjoy Baba Is You and you want to see it uh, at the Game Developers Choice Awards ceremony, you can either attend the ceremony live at GEC, which is coming up next month. Geez, we're only a month away. Oh, geez. Oh, geez. Um, uh, and um, if you are not coming to GEC, we'll miss you, but uh, you can watch the ceremony on March 18th here on the GEC Twitch channel. Just click that follow button. Um, and if you do that, you'll get a notification when we go live. We've also got other great interviews coming up with some of the other nominees. Uh, we've got uh, all year round we are doing uh, interviews of interesting game developers uh, because GDC is about uh, learning about how games get made, how games get sold, how games, how developers make games, what their lives are like making games. It's all those things. It's more. And we try to embody that here on the channel by talking to the people who make games and playing them and showing you sometimes how frustrating it can be. But sometimes it's great. Um, uh, uh, RV, thank you so much for joining us, and I hope you have a wonderful day. If people have questions for you about Baba Is You, where should they ask them? Uh, I actually just opened the stream, so I will be in the chat if some people <laughs> have want to ask questions directly. Uh, but otherwise, otherwise, you can send me questions on Twitter. Uh, how do you even say at at Baba Is You under dash on Twitter? I think that's maybe the easiest way to get questions to me. I usually answer, at least I answer easy, nice questions very quickly. If there are difficult questions, then I might hesitate. But uh, thank you very much for having me. It was very nice to talk about Baba Is You and uh, yeah, be a disembodied voice as mentioned earlier. I, I really like sometimes being a disembodied voice. It feels like I'm a ghost. <laughs> You're good at it. You sell it. <laughs> thank you. You, uh, you too. <laughs> thank right you all on. so much for watching. Yeah. Have a good day, everyone. Bye. Bye.